Hello and welcome to this latest edition of the Virtual Bridge Sessions. And today we're joined by a special guest, a special guest, a return to the stage by Jason Miles Campbell, <laughs> my co-host or other host. We have quite a few hosts here on the Virtual Bridge Sessions. And today we're talking about the publication of the JISC Digital Insights. And so this is the most comprehensive review of student experience around digital aspects of education. And, you know, I, for one, I, I, I have to admit, I've, I've read the summary, <laughs> but I am looking out and um, looking forward to learn more, especially your 10 insights, Jason. So over to you. And I'll go straight to sharing. There we go. Um, and good um, morning. And um, I'm going to go through this. Uh, so our Digital Experience Insights is a survey that's uh, offered to colleges and universities across the UK and indeed around the world. And um, I'm drawing out some of the lessons that have been learnt and some of the analysis uh, of last year's findings. Obviously, last year we were in a very different situation to the norm. And there are many things about digital that we can learn from it. I don't think any of these 10 insights are particularly groundbreaking. I think there are things we can uh, probably expect for the most part, but each of them has consequences. Uh, and the big question, and I've sorted it out into in each of these 10 insights, into what the finding was and perhaps what the actions should be as a result. Um, but they all have consequences for learning design in both further and higher education. Uh, for the purposes of today, I have actually brought together further and higher education and drawn out common elements between them. Um, though if you go to the, the link and that's available on the virtual bridge page, or if you Google JISC uh, Digital Experience Insights, you'll find that the reports are specific to further education and higher education. So as Kenji mentioned, uh, this is 60 odd thousand students uh, giving their view into their, their experience. And I'll point out that this is about uh, their perception of experience. Uh, there may be uh, times and indeed where we look at something and think, well, as an institution, we did this. So why isn't this student, why isn't the learner picking up on the fact that we offered support or whatever we did? And that's the question that uh, we often have to ask. Why does the perception uh, differ from the reality uh, in some ways? So uh, just for your uh, information as well, the, a number of uh, colleges and universities around Scotland uh, use the Digital Experience Insights. It's not all at the moment, though they are, uh, the, the, uh, the, the growth of take up is uh, quite quick. And it means that uh, those who are using it themselves, um, you might want to contact who has uh, done it at your institution because you can actually get benchmarks of your institution versus the big picture, if you like. And that looks at the comparison with similar institutions elsewhere. Anonymously, nobody's giving out your data, um, but um, yeah, you can compare with uh, elsewhere in the world. So, so then into the insights and what have I got for you then? So the first one of those, if I can move on. Uh, insight one. Okay, the, the theme, uh, 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 the first thing that we deal with is you and your current learning situation to look at how and what, in what situation the, the learners are learning. And we found that most students conducted their learning at least partly online. And um, no S Sherlock might be a term that comes uh, to mind in the past year for that. Uh, many HE students expected their course to be delivered fully on campus, uh, though for 87% of HE students, learning took place online. For FE students, that was different. And so um, um, uh, just uh, put a focus on the difference there. Um, what we need to do there is revisit the delivery model and accessibility of education and perhaps design for flexibility. Again, in conversations with an assistant principal for learning and teaching at Scottish College the other day, um, we were talking about the fact that there's obviously some students that th are thrived in the online world um, and maybe not thrived for some, but have been able to access education in a way they haven't. And we're talking about those learners who can't come onto the campus in the way others uh, can. Um, at the same time, we've obviously got students who very much valued their time on campus. And what I'm hearing, um, and anecdotally perhaps, is um, that there is a slight um, movement back towards looking at, can we go back to the way things were before? Uh, many staff who are delivering um, have, uh, have become accustomed to delivering by a particular mode of delivery that involves the students coming onto the campus and being there. 
So the question I think we've got is when we look at um, how we deliver further or higher education, then uh, how can we ensure that the largest number of learners get access to it? How can we ensure that given any class, if you like, um, then we design the, the offer in a way that allows as many to take it up in the best way possible? And, and that, those aspects of learning design have come on a long way in the past um, 18 months and, and indeed before that. Um, but we, we can't just simply take what the model was um, and continue with it or go back to it. Okay, that was insight one. Insight two, also on the theme of um, you and your current learning situation, we found that high numbers of learners had problems accessing online learning. Um, those um, uh, were technical difficulties, they were access to Wi-Fi, um, the high um, costs of mobile data in some cases, uh, access to um, systems and indeed access to a device at its home. Okay, again, those are problems that we know and have been trying to address through giving devices to students and providing uh, applications for that. So what action does that lead us to? Well, um, in order to alleviate that, we can ensure students and lecturers have access to appropriate technologies, obviously. Uh, again, there's something about the design. Uh, one of the things I would love to see happen is, uh, okay, I don't know the technology yet, is that whenever I wander past um, a, a Wi-Fi hotspot, if my device could load onto it uh, what I need for my next week's learning, if it could guess perhaps but through artificial intelligence uh, or something even less sophisticated than that um, what, what it is that I'm going to need and uh, so that when I'm sitting down and actually learning and whether that's on a bus without much in the way of connectivity or whether it's in my home where I don't have connectivity then, then I still have access to you know, offline to the materials that I need. But designing for offline as well as online is part of it, but ideally is making sure that all students and lecturers have that access to appropriate technologies. And again, I think we've come quite a way on that. I think, um, again, the, the, obviously institutions have recognised the difficulties in the past year and have begun, begun to ask questions um, of staff and students to understand where the gaps are, where the difficulties are. So um, in the, an ideal world, um, all students and lecturers will have the appropriate devices and appropriate connectivity mm -hmm. so that, and, and appropriate skills in order to use them. Um, but being aware of the difficulties and designing to try and get around them is certainly something that we can do at the moment. Insight three, um, we found in theme two, which is about digital platforms and services at your organisation, students felt that they were given the chance to be involved in decisions about online learning, so a positive. And this had grown quite a bit since the previous um, uh, surveys that we had done. Um, and it was notably higher in FE than HE, 49% in FE, uh, an agreement, and 35% in HE. Mm -hmm. Um, so the action there is continuing to build on working with students as active participants. And again, I can see many examples of where a conversation with learners about the way in which their learning is offered uh, will lead to the best ways and, way, and most effective ways of delivering online learning. So good practice, and I know in Scotland, actually through the work of Sparks, and indeed, and also in, in, in many institutions, or nearly all institutions, indeed, having very good um, relationships with student associations, student union, and student representatives, then, then we do pretty well. But again, it's in, in embedding that in the culture of uh, the, 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 the way in which we go about our, uh, our delivering our teaching and learning. Okay, insight four then. Um, digital platforms and services at your organisation, once again, we found that about 50% of students didn't find their learning environment easy to navigate, well designed or reliable. Um, so we asked them to engage online, but um, then they have difficulties with it. And I think the answers are obviously fairly straightforward down the bottom there. So uh, we need to improve the functionality, reliability and structure. I would love to be in that situation, as I'm sure you would, um, to take up services and platforms and tools um, where you don't need training. That's a, I always wonder when any organisation tries to sell me something that requires training, well, what is it that's non-intuitive about it? Wouldn't it be so much better if we headed towards that? But we're going to have to live with that. But we can still work um, to improve functionality, reliability and structure. But I think the second one is something very much within our control. 
again, from the oversight that I have um, uh, the, and the experience that I have um, dealing with many institutions in Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, I see that within even individual institutions, students are often faced with uh, inconsistency, you might call it, but you might call it a variety of different tools that they have to learn. And things look different between different courses or modules or you know, lecturers or, you know, or even activities. And that puts a strain on it. So um, I think the two parts of that are maybe settling for a core suite of tools, and I know that many institutions are heading in that direction. Um, but I think the last bit is important to recognise that sometimes will mean compromise. Um, and um, and, and uh, because I know very well, I was a lecturer once upon a time, I found the nice tools I wanted to use, and they weren't always the same as my colleague next door and the ones that he or she wanted to use. Um, so I think it's about starting from the learner experience, making sure that we keep it to as straightforward, uh, stable of tools as possible, um, such that students and, learn and, uh, and learners overall can um, get access to them and, and become familiar with them. Okay, insight five, theme three, technology in your learning then. The finding was many students found that the online environment did not support collaboration. Okay, mm -hmm. well, in, in the past year, we'd maybe moved on from the first um, part of lockdown. Um, and again, we understand the, the pressures on institutions to deliver meant that not always uh, was uh, the, were the, the learning experiences that designed for collaboration. Again, something we need to perhaps move forward on. Around half of the students didn't agree that online learning materials were well designed at the right level and pace and were engaging and motivating. And that's what they found. So um, we know that the action from that is uh, design uh, learning for online or hybrid delivery. Make sure it's fit for that purpose, um, such that students feel that they are collaborating, that it's a well designed, right level and pace, engaging and motivating. And indeed about including uh, improving the peer-to-peer -peer interactions and also the student uh, lecturer interactions as well. Um, after all, uh, one of the great uh, advantages of online can be collaboration in ways that aren't possible in the physical world. So um, let's look at taking the uh, like static resources, especially on further and uh, make learning activities and make sure that we incorporate those. Moving on then, um, insight six, uh, looking at your digital skills. Now we found that substantial numbers of students didn't agree that they'd received support for learning online. Now that was an interesting finding because again, um, uh, from my uh, um, dealings with colleges and universities, mm -hmm. uh, then I think there was great lengths were gone to to provide support for um, the move online and it was there. Uh, however, um, there's no getting away from the fact that um, in this survey that uh, we're talking about 50% of HE and 40% of FE students saying that they didn't uh, feel they had received support for learning online. That could be because they received support, but it wasn't what they felt was the right sort of support. It could be that it was available, but they, for whatever reason, didn't access it. Um, and so it's maybe something that we have to look at ensuring that the digital skills support is easy to find and perhaps addressing that question of uh, when it's made available but isn't accessed, what are the barriers to, to that? And part of that might be discussing, discussing proficiency levels and development more explicitly, more often with learners, um, both in terms of um, engaging the learner in their, their own learning throughout their course, but also their understanding of what digital skills are going to be required in the workplace uh, once they finish or, or indeed as they learn. Insight seven, um, again on digital skills. We found that many learners felt that expectations were too high um, in the online world and concerns were not being heard, especially in higher education. Uh, whilst confidence in online learning grows, and uh, not all learners uh, felt safe and supported online, uh, felt safe and supported online. Okay, so I think the action from that is avoiding assumption uh, as to how people are engaging uh, and making sure that the uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the approach isn't simply governed by those who are able to adapt um, and, and approach it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, I think the way forward is consulting and supporting learners um, and, and uh, learners on an individual basis. 
ensuring that no one feels left to struggle alone uh, with online learning, um, dealing with technical issues, uh, resource access, or understanding what is required. And again, from the text feedback, we heard a number of instances, um, and again, time and time again, in these 60,000 responses um, about um, issues that were never resolved that students had brought up. So again, we have to look at dealing with that because for each learner that has one of these issues, they could be blocked from completing their learning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, insight eight then, and even forward your digital skills. Um, FE learners in particular turned to lecturers and tutors for online learning support. Interestingly, HE learners used a far broader um, a variety of assistance, um, often turning to um, peers, online videos, friends and family um, uh, for support. Uh, you'll note that actually within that, the degree to which they turned to um, libraries or IT desks, etc., or even learning technologists support within institutions was actually relatively low in, in, in terms of the way uh, they're reporting back on the survey. So the action there might be to support staff, and by that I mean teaching staff, to develop both competence and confidence in online learning, given that especially in FE, um, they are the ones that are being turned to uh, to provide support in online learning. Um, also, we might want to balance up the, um, the onus on them by flagging up the other services more clearly. <coughs> Excuse me. And we, that, that's, we might want to make other sources of support more visible and accessible, um, and so that the the their the value of those is further gained um, and further leveraged. And insight nine, um, the, uh, this theme is the learner voice and positive aspects of online learning. Um, the finding was that in terms of positive aspects um, for FE students, uh, students identified efficiency of time, not having to travel into the campus, um, uh, being able to study at uh, the time that suited them, um, flexibility, the different ways of accessing the learning, and pace, um, when for those who might zoom ahead and those who might take an extra while to, to come to grips with um, something, these were all the things that um, FE students and uh, recognised as the top positives uh, from the move to online learning in the past year. For HE, it was slightly different. It was um, effectiveness of learning, um, again, moving away from the traditional model of uh, perhaps uh, uh, lectures and tutorials to more varied and, um, and uh, engaging content. Uh, access to recordings was rated very highly. Uh, again, the flexibility of not having to be in a place at a time. Um, interactivity, the, the, the improvements in interactivity, and ease of communication. Um, with, um, I, again, the, we had many stories of students beforehand trying to get hold of lecturers, and lecturers being obviously um, very short of time um, to engage and doing their best, um, but do, shifting it online made the access um, easier. So the action is ensuring your learning design harnesses these positives because it would be a shame to lose them. And it'll come as no surprise that Insight 10 is about the negative aspects of online learning. Maybe shouldn't have finished on a negative, but here we have it. But here are the things that perhaps we need to concentrate on in terms of action. So um, again, there's a difference between further and higher education, though there were some um, that were in common. So in further education, um, a negative was practical subject skills. Um, obviously, if you're, you're going to learn to uh, lay bricks or uh, do plumbing, then there's nothing that replaces actually having bricks or plumbing in your hands. Um, so uh, that, that was one of the areas. Uh, there was a recognition still that uh, many skills can be primed at least and theory learnt in different ways, but uh, nothing beats uh, the hands-on experience. For HE, one of the interesting things is the impact on the university experience, uh, the social learning part, the part of being a cohort of students um, it came first as the, the thing that had been somewhat lost. And a lot of work has been done about um, forming community online as best as possible and how that works. And again, something that might be looked at for those who can't engage in the traditional uh, turn up at a university and go through uh, four years or three years of uh, study uh, along with uh, uh, people that you, they, they you see across all that time. And uh, finally, <coughs> uh, both FE and F uh, HE recognise the technical issues and um, a lot of unengaging content um, as being negatives of online learning. Again, some might say that we had um, early days and we had a, quite a, uh, obviously an emergency in front of us. 
And I think we probably all have seen content, including indeed my presentation here today, that could have been more interactive. And uh, and only through circumstances this morning, I was going to have to get you voting on these slides as to and rating them as to the most important out of the ten. But uh, again, practical elements uh, this morning and uh, barriers uh, uh, intervened to stop me doing it. And we have to be aware of those because then, then and again, time is, uh, is short for many, and there are many uh, calls on uh, tutors and lecturers. Uh, time, um, but do our best to ensure at the bottom there our learning design addresses these negatives. And with that, I'm coming to a close and I'm going to invite discussion and questions. I shall stop sharing there. Thanks for that, Jason. Um, and, and I should point out, I, I know you're significantly under the weather at the moment, so I, I, I truly appreciate you battling through professional as always. Um, so one of the one of the points that stands out for me that I imagine causes concern for everyone listening is the notion that students feel that they're not supported, especially in that aspect of their online experience, because I know the extent to which all of the colleges that we interact with, certainly at CDN, have done their utmost to provide that level of support in terms of improving online engagement, online communication, providing the tools, the materials, the laptops, the internet connectivity for, for students. So over and above, it's in some cases, it's hard to imagine how they could have done more. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, you, you brought the point up yourselves. You know, what exactly is the case? Did, is it that students just had expectations that couldn't be met would that be the issue you think were there were there exceptions was there were there any responses that gave an insight as to what the particular pain points were well something uh, emma has put up about managing expectations indeed and that's uh, one of the things but i think uh, um in, certainly in well, both fe and he there's the question of resourcing uh, and uh, what we're resourced to do. And there's two ways of approaching that. Uh, one is that to, do we need to somehow change the model um, as to how we approach it such that every learner feels that they're being adequately supported because they aren't at the moment um, by that survey. Um, and, um, and the second one is give the, uh, our sectors more resources mm -hmm. so they can provide a greater level. Um, and I think um, uh, the answer is probably a mix of both. Um, the, uh, and um, th th there can be shifts in which we, the way we do things in order to allow us to uh, perhaps support more. And, uh, and again, that can be better use of data and analytics. It's certainly one of the things you would expect from uh, my JISC background to say is, uh, is one of the things in the future. If we can um, be more efficient in identifying those who need support, ideally uh, at the point they need it or beforehand, uh, then so much the better. Um, but but um, what we can't do is just simply work the double the number of hours to provide even more support. Um, the, the, that's um, the, well, people have gone, as you say, uh, uh, um, above and beyond uh, already. Uh, but that still doesn't take away from the fact that we have got significant numbers of learners saying they don't feel they've been sufficiently supported, which we need to address. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, we do have time for a few questions here. So in in the room. Um, I'm, you know, you know, I'll just start picking on people. Uh, it's it's best to just launch yourself in and volunteer early with a question. Um, <laughs> but in the absence of that, Carmen, look, I feel you're staring at me here, so I feel you have something to share, all the way from Banff. For us, um, I suppose we had the same issues as as most, but um, on the whole, I think. Um, you know, they did appreciate the the extra effort, etc. But there is always going to be one or two that feel that, you know, that we didn't quite reach the mark, but you've just got to continue to strive to do better. There is definitely room for improvement in, in, in a lot of areas. Um, and I do agree with Emma that, yeah, we're not, we're not experts, but we will give it a go. We will try our best. And I think it's important to listen um, to your students and just try and compromise, I suppose, and, and just do what you can um, with the time that you do have. Um, you know, because it, it is much nicer if they are engaged and, you know, it does save a lot of time in the long run, you know, when you, when you come to, to actually um, 
assess these these uh, kids, at least if they have engaged, it makes that task a little bit more um, enjoying. Um, Can I ask you, Karen? Oh, yeah. I'm interested. I think I have a perception that quite often the support is in fact available. It's just that there's barriers and uh, to the learner taking it up, and that's um, and I, I just I, I I don't know if you've got any particular um, uh, view on what those barriers are. If it's just disengagement or um, uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 any view as to like why the support that's there sometimes isn't taken up. Um, well, for us, I mean, I, I know that, uh, well, as a staff member, um, and it's certainly something that I would um, and, and do continue to, to sign, signpost the students towards, is our Digital Futures team. They are fantastic, and there's so much resources available to them. And it's, it's really just a case of, actually, you know, before you say you have a problem, have you actually troubleshooted? Have you had a look online? You know, um, and it's through uh, my Nescal platform that we use, um, and everything is um, quite well signposted for them. So I would always just remind them: Have you actually troubleshooted before you've um, just sent me that message to say that you, you, you know, um, that you can't find the support? Sometimes they just don't want to bother looking for it but you know if you just um i suppose give them a nudge in the right direction most of them would take it up but um yeah and indeed we've had a virtual bridge on your offer up there and um, we're very yeah. impressed by it indeed so well then yeah, yeah yeah so hazel how about at west lothian do you recognize the points raised in in these 10 insights do you do you think that mirrors what happened at West Lothian College? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, it all resonates, every slide resonates with what happened over the last sort of 18 months. And even now things are starting to change. We're not even sure what the change is, but there's there's new pedagogies that feel that, that are starting to be introduced. Like, how do you start to introduce learning where some students are in, but some students are home? That's a new challenge. I think for us, the, the big thing that we we underestimated is the ability of students to be able to learn online. And there is, a, there is probably a misconception that young people are all able to do it because they walk about with phones or but they, they really struggle with it. And, it. and accessibility was a problem as well. You know, some of, the, you know, some of our students from maybe the most deprived areas can access um, IT, so there's a lot of barriers in terms of actually getting onto the learning and the to the platforms in the first place. So that's been a, a big issue for us when it's been a there's been a huge amount of work going on to ensure that we could do our very best to ensure that students could learn. Um, and then once they're on, it's it varies in terms of confidence and ability. Um, so yeah, everything resonates with us. There's nothing there that, that that stands out that's a surprise. I think for us going forward is we're still learning. And I think Karen is is reiterated what Jason's saying is that we really need to listen to our students. You know, we really need to listen to them and understand what does work for them and what doesn't work, and then design um learning and teaching by listening to those students. So there's still a lot of work to go on in terms of future planning and, a, and it does feel like it's changing because during the pandemic where there was a full lockdown you were an online learner but again as I think somebody commented on not everybody's a learning technologist so to design that learning and teaching is really challenging um, to, to be able to put something online so you're not really an online learner you're a learner learning on an online platform but that doesn't make you an online learner it's completely different so a lot of challenges but now going forward we've probably got into a little bit of a comfort zone so staff who are teaching on site probably starting to maybe those digital skills are maybe starting to get further away again because they're not using them every day and being challenged and then you've got some staff who are delivering on site and then maybe they do one day online so their digital skills are really fresh and they're able to adapt to the student needs and then now we've got staff who are coming in to teach students, some are at home and some are 
online. So it's like, here's a new challenge. And again, it's listening to students and trying to find the resources and the support that can and can give the best learning experience possible. I think that's that's an excellent summary, Hazel. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for in this recorded portion of the virtual bridge sessions, but we will continue the conversation on here. And hopefully, um, if you have a chance in YouTube land to join us for a live session, we'll see you here with us. But until then, as always, thanks to Jason, everyone who attended today and everyone else. Please stay safe.